Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 324, Dr. J.C. Beale, The Contradictory Christ, Part 1. Dr. J.C. Beale is the O'Neill Family Chair of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. He has an MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary and a PhD in Philosophy from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Dr. Beale is well known for his books and articles on topics in logic, which you can find at his website, entailments.net. But he's with us today to discuss his book, The Contradictory Christ, recently published in the series Oxford Studies in Analytic Theology. Dr. Beale, welcome to the Trinity's podcast. Thank you, Dale. I'm truly humbled to be here, and I'm exceptionally grateful for your engagement with my work. I really appreciated the book and really appreciated the recent privilege of being a part of an online seminar on it. But to start off, why don't you just give us a little background and tell us why you went to seminary and then how you ended up pursuing philosophy and specifically logic? Well, everything traces to my background. I grew up in the country, the rural parts of western Pennsylvania, not far from the big city of Sharon, Pennsylvania, one's home to Westinghouse and Sharon Steel, and not far from the gigantic city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I grew up on about 40 acres with no neighbors, but lots of room to be outside. I used to walk halfway up our quarter mile driveway and put a hammock in some trees and just read. Beyond some stuff in mathematics, one of the things I read a lot of was theology. A lot of Burkhoff, Warfield, Calvin, but really anything, including Kierkegaard, Bart, Tillich, and others. I probably understood none of it, Actually, I'm sure that I didn't, but I read and thought about it all and a lot. Theological discussion was generally common in our family, and I found it to be important and interesting. But I was also talented in mathematics, and even though I didn't know what it was, philosophy. After high school, I attended a small private Christian liberal arts college, namely Grove City College, not far from where I grew up, where I officially majored in philosophy. When I came near to graduating, I knew that I needed to think more. I asked some faculty what I should do. They said to go to seminary, whereat they said I could explore whether I might be suited for being a pastor or perhaps suited for systematic theological work. So I applied to Princeton Seminary and went there. What I found was that I was not suited to be a pastor. However, I seemed to be good at theology and relatedly philosophical issues in and around theology. While there, I met David Souza, now a philosopher at the University of Texas, who was just starting his PhD in philosophy at Princeton. And through him, I met Gilbert Harmon, from whom I learned a lot, and in turn, Bas van Prossen, who was and remains a significant influence on my thinking and work. The story of how I wound up at Amherst to do philosophy is both boring and long, but I really enjoyed Amherst, a place where, at the time, A lot of logical work in both philosophy and linguistics was being done, and a lot of fun work in mind and metaphysics was being done, too. After finishing my PhD, I had every intention of returning to work in or around theology, but the current of any academic career can sometimes quickly carry one in different directions, such as life. But I'm happy to finally be publishing some of my views in theology, and doing so, I hope, with a much more informed understanding of logic, philosophy, and theology than I would have otherwise had publishing sooner. So that's the basic reason I went to seminary and how I wound up pursuing philosophy and logic. Now, was your Christian background like kind of a Reformed or Presbyterian sort of view? It was Presbyterian. Uh Uh-huh. Leaning more on the Reformed, but um, Presbyterian church, it just sort of kept breaking up into uh, different uh, strands. But growing up, we went to a Presbyterian church, but all the books in my library, my dad's library, were reformed. As I said, a lot of Burkhoff, Warfield, Calvin, 
the other people I mentioned, Bart Tillich, I, I mean, that was just me picking books up at a bookstore. Dr. Bale, it seems to me that the starting point for your thinking about Christ is what people call the Fourth Ecumenical Council from the year 451. What, in your view, does that council teach, and why do you accept what it says? To your first question, I'm not Catholic, but I do see the given council as defining what has become the standard doctrine. At the very least, the Council of Chalcedon 451 defines the standard Christology, namely that Christ is fully human and that Christ is fully divine, not partly human and fully divine, not partly divine and fully human, not some hybrid new nature called human divine, but simply human, as human as you and me, and simply divine, and therefore God. This looks to be contradictory if, as the Council also lays out, Christ is exactly one person. Jesus, Son of God, Lord, Messiah. The key claim of the Council, for present purposes, is just that, namely, that Christ is exactly one person who is fully divine, ergo, has all properties essential to divinity, including the limitlessness of God, and also fully human, therefore, has all properties essential to humanity, including all its limitations. Your second question asks why I accept the standard account as laid out in the given council. I'm sure that some of it has to do with how I was raised and the creeds and doctrines professed in those formative years and beyond. But there are also some principled reasons that I accept the standard account. One is that despite the social political swirls around it, the Council of Chalcedon 451 captures what strikes me to be the simple truth of Christ's boundary-breaking being, God who is human. Are the councils as divinely inspired as scripture? I don't know. And tradition outside of the Catholic Church seems not to have a settled view. I certainly reject that Christians must confess all conciliar claims about Christ, unless they are Catholic, which I'm not. And if there's a clear clash between what's obviously true in scripture and what's obviously declared in a council, then scripture wins, hands down, always. So I don't in any way give priority to councils as authorities over scripture or other forms of established revelation. I see them as defining the standard theology, the theological theory, for a large body of Christian thinkers. And it's not clear to me that the standard theory needs to be rejected. A second reason for accepting at least the core Chalcedonian axiom, so to speak, is that if Christ isn't fully divine, isn't God, then Apart from not clearly being worthy of worship, I think that Christ's revelations may in fact just be his guesses. I'm not saying that they have to be guesses if Christ isn't divine, but the possibility is immediately a live one if Christ is not in fact divine, not in fact God. This is not a generalizable epistemological principle I'm advancing. It's merely a claim about the odds as I see them. Inasmuch as Christ is divine, that is, Christ is God, whatever he claimed to be true is thereby true, and eternally so. Could a magic man or a special prophet accurately convey God's own description of himself as well as God incarnate could? Yes, as far as I can see. But God incarnate is the best source, so far as I can see. And with tradition, as recorded in Chalcedon, I accept that Christ was just that, God incarnate, fully and astonishingly so. Perhaps worth saying is that one can follow Christ's core teachings while rejecting that Christ is divine. Not only can one do so, perhaps many people do just that. They'd simply be accepting a deviant theology or non-standard Christology if accepting one at all. And ultimately, while we have a responsibility to get at the true and systematic theology, I'd say that following Christ is at bottom following his new commandment, explicitly so-called, that was marked on Maundy Thursday. The councils and theology generally are certainly secondary at best to that direct commandment. Still, as to your chief questions, I do accept the relevant claims of Chalcedon, particularly that Christ is one person who is fully human, but who is also fully divine. In the end, if one were to ask me for an argument that successfully converts one who rejects the divinity of Christ to one who accepts it 
I'd say that you're asking the wrong person. That's always been and remains the job of just one person, namely Christ. So that's my basic answer. So Dr. Beale, it sounds like you accept a traditional Protestant view that the council teachings should be accepted because and insofar as they actually are getting scriptural teaching right. Is that right? Yes. In the book, I take the target council anyway to be a settled matter. And I do take it to be standard theology, as you say, standard Protestant theology and views of the councils, that they get scripture right as far as they go. So that's accurate. But I, I should flag that neither the standard account nor any other candidate for the truth is beyond examination, of course. This is important stuff. And so, like any would-be true theory, it must at least withstand critical examination. It's just that if the full divinity of Christ, or even full humanity of Christ, or one person who is Christ were to be rejected, we're just not talking about the same account. And if one puts the councils over scripture, then we're also at odds in our methodology and we need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what about some common solutions in the literature? Do we really have to say that Christ is a contradiction? Dr. Beale, we philosophers are known to take what some consider extreme or unusual stances, but it's been my experience that often we do so because we find that common solutions to some of these problems simply don't work. So as best we can tell, it's the extreme one which is left standing. To just take one example, I'm an open theist, and some people consider that really extreme, but that's because I examined every single other view that's out there, and I thought, well, these just don't work. Open theism exacts a price, but I think it's the most likely true one. But anyway, I don't want to go off on that distraction. In this fascinating new book of yours, you defend the view that Christ is, as you say, a contradiction, meaning a real being about whom contradictions are true. We'll talk a lot more about that later, but why don't we start with why you don't accept some of the more common solutions which are out there? So we could start with the carefully reasoned work of Dr. Timothy Paul, who I've had the privilege of interviewing a couple of times. And I think we're both actually kind of big fans of his work in terms of just all around philosophical quality, not to mention a rare and good sense of humor. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's funny. And he is good, and the work's very good, as you say, but he is funny for sure. I remember once being at a conference at Notre Dame and he was in the audience and he asked this he asked this long question and it had to do with being flogged while eating a Big Mac. And uh it was a brilliant question but I was I I was laughing so hard that all I remember is the the mental picture that resulted and not not whatever his devastating point was. <laughs> yeah. That's a true story. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I believe it. That's uh that's Tim Paul right there. Yeah. But anyway, back back to his uh serious work. If Christ is fully divine, it would seem, I think almost anybody would agree, that he must be impeccable, you know, such that in principle he cannot sin. But if he's fully human, then he must be peccable, that is, such that in principle he could sin. So how would Dr. Paul understand Christ so as to avoid any contradiction relating to impeccability, and why don't you accept his solution? You're correct in the formulation of the apparent contradiction, which arises from properties that are essential to divinity and properties essential to humanity. Your question about Dr. Paul's work is twofold. I'll take each in turn, focusing on the example of being peccable and being impeccable. And just to be clear, Christ remained sinless, despite his being able to sin. That's something that no human being before him achieved and something that, on some views of, of atonement, was necessary. 
But the topic on the table is simply Christ's apparently contradictory features of peccability and impeccability, being able to sin, being unable to sin. With that clarification in hand, the fundamental question is exactly as you put it. How can Christ be both peccable and impeccable, able to sin and unable to sin without contradiction? Well, Dr. Timothy Paul's answer is ultimately negative. He rejects that Christ can be, let alone is, both peccable and impeccable. After all, these are, even by Dr. Paul's lights, contrary predicates, in the sense that they are jointly satisfied only by way of contradiction, a possibility that Dr. Paul firmly rejects. What makes Dr. Paul's work interesting is that, being a Catholic, he's committed to saying of Christ whatever the councils say of Christ. And the given councils certainly seem to ascribe many pairs of such contrary properties to Christ. For example, being passable and impassable, or just to be explicit, able to suffer and unable to suffer, and more. So how does Dr. Paul at once reject that the given contrary properties are jointly exemplified by Christ while accepting, as he must, being a Catholic, the words of the councils? The answer in the end is just that. Dr. Paul delivers a way to express words that are, if not clarified, spelled exactly the same as the problematic predicates, but in fact mean different things. Sticking to the example on the table, Dr. Paul's strategy involves what I call starring the two predicates, peccable and impeccable. These star predicates, call them star peccable and star impeccable, are derivative from their standard starless mates. The strategy is straightforward. The satisfaction conditions of the standard predicates, the ones that give rise to the apparent contradiction, are just the familiar ones. Something X is peccable, if and only if it's true that X can sin. Something X is impeccable, if and only if it's false that X can sin. Dr. Paul accepts these standard definitions, but rejects that they apply to Christ. Instead, Dr. Paul adverts to his star derivatives, namely... Something X is star peccable if and only if X has a concrete nature that is peccable. Something X is star impeccable if and only if X has a concrete nature that is impeccable. Putting these Powell line pieces together, and I get the pronunciation of Powell line from Oliver Crisp because to call it Pauline is just confusing. (laughs) So putting these Powell line pieces together, we have that for an object to be star peccable is just to have, in some sense, a so-called concrete nature, whatever they are, which itself is peccable, i.e. which itself can sin. And to be star impeccable is just to have, in some sense, a so-called concrete nature, again, whatever they are, which itself is impeccable, that is, which itself cannot sin. Now, there's just absolutely no contradiction or even appearance of contradiction here. One asks, how can Christ be both peccable and impeccable without contradiction? Dr. Paul's answer, he can't. But he can be star peccable and star impeccable by being suitably related to different so-called concrete natures, one of which can sin and the other can't. Nothing on this view looks even remotely contradictory because, of course, on this view, we were talking about very different subjects from Christ when we appeared to be attributing contrary properties to Christ. And this takes us directly to your second question, namely, why I don't accept Dr. Paul's view. I don't accept it because it changes the subject. On the standard Christology, as stamped at Chalcedon 451, We're saying that Christ is fully divine, and that Christ, same subject, is fully human, and that Christ is exactly one person, lest one think that we're attributing these apparently contrary properties to different persons. Of course, as Dr. Paul's work makes abundantly plain, similar to the work of Dr. James Anderson in this respect, and in an expository fashion, the work of Dr. Richard Cross, The standard Christology, so understood, looks to be contradictory. Dr. Paul, along with Dr. Anderson and Dr. Cross, rejects the logical possibility of contradictions being true, and so is forced to respond to the apparent contradiction in a different way. 
Dr. Paul's strategy is to simply augment the language in a way that we're derivatively still talking about Christ in target affirmations, but only derivatively. And I simply don't see the need to do this if there's a simpler account of the apparent contradiction that doesn't change the meanings of the target terms. Hmm. So, Dr. Beale, one aspect of Dr. Paul's work is that he argues that the people who wrote up this council uh, definition must have had in mind two natures in the sense of, you know, like individuals, or as it said now, concrete natures, like, you know, subjects of properties. He thinks it's mistaken, Dr. Paul does, to interpret the two natures traditions as having to do with what are nowadays called abstract natures, you know, just the property of divinity and the property of humanity. Does your take on this assume that it's right that the two natures are abstract and not concrete? You're right in what you just relayed about his view. I don't know whether he'd say that the only notion of nature that appears in these councils is the concrete one. In fact, that's probably completely wrong. But certainly, he is forced into this metaphysical interpretation. Why? Well, I asked him once, because I thought you could redo it using just, you know, not commit to concrete natures, but just nature in a typical so-called abstract sense. I mean, mm -hmm. it just means, you know, it's if you have this nature, then you've got these properties, no matter who you are, and so on. But he said no, because for him, you need a so-called concrete thing. And this isn't entirely clear what on earth that is. But you need a concrete thing that can walk around and be able to sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you need a concrete thing that can't. And this is supposed to be the divine nature, which mm -hmm. is supposed to be not identical to Christ. My evaluation of Dr. Paul's work is one that understands that his solution is committed to concrete natures, whatever else they may be, doing the work. And I'm not going to take a stand on whether the council were relying on those natures. Frankly, I guess I find it implausible for reasons that I'm not sure whether I put in the book, but let me just quickly give you two reasons why I find it sort of historically implausible. Mm -hmm. Not that there wasn't a notion of concrete nature. That's a that, no question whatsoever. But that when they say Christ is divine, Christ is human, what they're really talking about primarily are these, you know, one concrete thing that's not identical to Christ that walks around and is able to sin and this other concrete thing that's not identical to Christ. Yeah, I mean, you have what looked like on the face of it to be two persons, but he has exactly. a way around that, which we won't go into. But He does have a way around it. I, but the way I look at this, quite frankly, and again, to repeat, I think that uh, Dr. Paul's work is some of the best work on this, but it just looks to me like squirming to try to, like, you know, on the surface, you say Christ is divine, Christ is human. What does that mean? And that we're talking about one person, Christ, right? Well, the flat-footed reading is going to be, well, Christ is divine and has every property entailed by being so. Mm -hmm. Christ is human and has every essential property involved in being human. And this is the same subject. That's where the, con the apparent contradiction arises. And so Dr. Paul's solution is to change so that the subjects who get to primarily bear these properties entailed by divinity and humanity, for example, being able to sin, being unable to sin, are simply different subjects. And yeah. you ask yourself, how can something be able to sin if it's not a person? Well, you know, and if it is a person, then there are all these persons in Christ. These are old heresies that in letter, Dr. Paul avoids, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But not only is he committed to this particular metaphysical view that demands these so-called concrete natures, as the key, by the way, to the consistency of Christ. Not only is he committed to that metaphysical view, but he's also committed to, as you pointed out, but we, we, we won't discuss, um, particular reading of what it is to be a person. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he's driven to this stuff just to try to accommodate the apparent contradiction. Without accepting the contradiction. 
again, my book is written partly because from my perspective, I just wonder why not accept the contradiction? And let me just say on his reading, he is committed to this historical interpretation mainly to keep his account viable. And here's what's implausible about the historical interpretation of what the conciliar fathers were up to when they were saying Christ is divine, Christ is human. It's not that nobody ever talked about concrete natures, anything like that. I mean, it's clear that in the councils they talk about qua stuff and according to this nature and this and that and the other thing. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But in that simple statement, Christ is divine and human, to me, if they really meant what Tim Paul says they meant and is forced to say that they meant, this is one of the most astonishing historical events ever, that the key to the consistency of Christ in the face of this obvious contradiction was lost until Tim Paul rediscovered it, you know, as if somehow this would be misplaced. That's one thing. The other thing is, how do you even make sense of the heretics? These ways around the, con the contradiction. One is to say, well, God can't really be human because then you get all these problems. God can't really be divine because you get this contradiction on top of blasphemy and other things. But on Paul's view, everything's compatible. What's, what's the worry? All you're saying is there are these two natures, whatever they are, these two other objects, and Christ, the one person, has certain relations to them. And that's all it takes. Mm. After all, you can have um, things being square and circular on Paul's account of how language works. Something is star square, if and only if it's related to an object that's square mm -hmm. in the right way. It has this concrete nature, whatever that would mean. Um, and it's star circular, you know, just if it's related to a concrete nature that's circular. To me, it's just, it's hard to make sense of what people were worried about if he actually is right about what the conciliar fathers were saying. Hmm. And also, why has the church, why has the Catholic church admitted that these are mysteries? You know, I don't mean anything fancy by that, except, well, it looks contradictory and, and now you say things about you know, God being so transcendent that we don't understand or something, which of course is true about some things. We just don't know exactly where or what. Why would anyone think that there's any tension here if Tim Paul is right? Yeah. I, I mean, just to be fair to him, you know, his book has a lot of interesting criticisms of rival approaches. And I think his dissatisfaction with all the rivals is partly what makes him willing to pay the metaphysical price of his view in terms of, you know, how he thinks about supposita and persons and so on. And also just the, you know, how revisionary it is about the terms in question. He just thinks it's worth it. Myself, I'm, I'm not sure what the council had in mind. Uh, I still want to do more reading. On the face of it, the whole situation is kind of strange. You know, it, it was a dispute between the one nature people and the two nature people. Afterwards, both sides kind of act like they had lost, but uh, the one nature people hated it more, and the two nature people eventually decided they were Chalcedonians. It's not clear to me if how much the council had a coherent view in mind, or if they were just kind of splitting the difference. The two natures people are right, but hey, there's only one Christ here. And how do those things go together? I We'll see a couple more answers that other people have tried to put forward, you know, with what, what they might have had in mind. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. And lest any listener think that I was, you know, coming down hard on uh, Dr. Paul's work or in any way being unfair, let me make it clear that I, as I say in the book, I think it's one of the most important works uh, out there on the problem. I agree. Mm -hmm. It's just that, as I say, um, if you ask me why I don't accept it, it's for the reasons given. It looks very much to me like it's changing the subject. Mm. And it's hard to understand what the dispute would be if all that's being said here is related to the one nature, concrete thing in one way and related to a concrete thing in another. And th those other concrete things are the things that are really peccable and impeccable. 
I just am puzzled by what there is to dispute there. I mean, these are fine definitions. They allow you to s say that Christ is star peccable and star impeccable without contradiction, assuming that you can give consistent accounts of what it is to have a concrete nature and all that stuff, which is, by the way, not trivial in my opinion. When the Trinity's podcast returns, why not just say that Christ as divine is incapable of sinning, while Christ as human is capable of sinning? Let's talk about a more traditional sort of move that I think you see all over traditional theology, whether it's philosophical or not. It's related to what we were just talking about, and it's trying to get around apparent contradictions. So why not just qualify our statements using the word as or in Latin qua? So someone will say Christ as divine is incapable of sinning, but Christ as human is capable of sinning. Does that solve the problem in your view? Well, it certainly gives a non-contradictory account, indeed, one that isn't even remotely apparently contradictory. After all, we're talking about two different subjects, namely the one named Christ as human and the other one named Christ as divine. Mm. There's not even a hint of contradiction if one says of the first that he's peccable and of the second that he's impeccable. After all, the apparent contradiction comes only when we talk about the same subject. And here, I thought we were talking about Christ himself, the one person Christ who is human and who is divine and so is peccable and also impeccable. But who is this Christ as human and who is this Christ as divine? If you say that exactly one of them is identical to Christ, you'll thereby easily avoid contradiction via a route that was deemed by the standard account to be heretical ruled out as a non-standard Christology at Chalcedon. That is, if you were to identify Christ with the divine and then let the other human person or the other human <laughs> concrete nature walk around and be something else that has this otherwise conflicting property, or vice versa. You run into heresy, but you avoid the contradiction. But if you say that both of them, namely the one called Christ as human and also the other called Christ as divine, if you say that both of them are identical to Christ himself, then, of course, you're right back to Christ himself being impeccable and impeccable. Right. Something that the given qua strategy that you put on the table is aiming to avoid. Yeah. I mean, you might take Christ as divine just to mean Christ because he's divine is incapable of sinning. Christ as human, Christ because he's human is capable of sinning. But then we've just swept the contradiction under the carpet with this extra language. I agree with you. As a matter of fact, by the way, my own view is that that Quantog nicely does offer explanation. Christ is impeccable. Qua divine, what do we mean? We mean Christ is impeccable because Christ is divine. Hmm. But Christ is also peccable because Christ is human and so on. As you say, if it's supposed to be a response to the contradiction, it sweeps it under the carpet. But the particular cross strategy that you rightly highlight is certainly a traditional and common one. But it certainly doesn't solve the problem, as you just said. It avoids it by remaining silent on who the real subjects are mm -hmm. in relation to the one person Christ himself. In many ways, this sort of qua strategy faces the same problem that Dr. Paul's strategy faces. It changes the subject. Indeed, it's hard not to see Dr. Paul's strategy as collapsing into the very qua strategy you've highlighted. And interestingly, Dr. Paul himself rightly criticizes in some very powerful ways. 
if you identify what Dr. Paul calls Christ's concrete human nature with the given qua-tagged subject called Christ as human, and similarly for Christ's concrete divine nature, then the two positions face pretty much exactly the same problem. Hmm. Again, changing the subject. But if you allow a contradiction, and a true contradiction into the picture, then okay, maybe this language is just fine, taken at the face value way that I just explained. The way you just explained it is the way I indeed understand it. I don't mm-hmm. think it's just fine language. I think it's important. Mm-hmm. I think some of those qua expressions or according to or in virtue of or as, these are explanatory expressions that mm-hmm. point to the explanation of the contradictions true of Christ. But what if we instead shifted and tried to say that Christ is impeccable as divine and also Christ is peccable as human? What if we just qualify the predicate, not the subject? This too is an obvious way to avoid contradiction. We have an apparent contradiction when saying that Christ is peccable and that Christ is impeccable. The views we've discussed so far reject that there's any object with those two properties, since the object per impossible, they say, would have to be contradictory. The first qua strategy is to say that there's an equivocation of the term Christ, and we're really ascribing the contrary properties to different objects, not to Christ, or at least to some other different object, if Christ is there, but that gets you into heresy. This other qua strategy now on the table aims to firmly keep Christ as a subject, and that's good. But instead, the view attributes different properties from peccability and impeccability. So you don't get the obvious contradiction, assuming that you choose the right properties. Now, you ask why I don't accept this strategy, since, well, it doesn't change the subject of the target predications, which has been my complaint. First, I simply don't see the need to flee from the contradiction that drives the strategy. But set that aside for now. There's another reason that I don't accept it, and it's similar to my reason for rejecting the first qua strategy. Namely, we should ask, what are these properties that we're attributing to Christ? To my knowledge, no explicit qua theorist who claims that the apparent contradiction is explained away by finding equivocation in the predicate position has answered the most salient question, which is, what are the properties? How, if at all, are they related to peccability and impeccability? Pending answers to these questions, there's not really a view there to be further evaluated. And I should flag that I think Dr. Paul's discussion of this, though I wouldn't agree with all of it, is actually very telling. He gives one of the best discussions of this sort of view. So I would recommend that. I don't know what it means to say that something is impeccable as divine unless that entails that it's impeccable. And similarly, I don't know what it means to say that Christ is peccable as human unless that entails peccable. But if you admit those entailments, we're just right back where we started. You're spot on. And I think you have just concisely and truly given the problem with these views. If those entailments aren't there, what on earth are we talking about? Moreover, I would say the entailments from peccability to able to sin and impeccability to unable to sin. If we don't have those entailments, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another solution that's pretty popular in the recent literature. You have people like Oliver Crisp, Brian Leftow, Eleanor Stump, going for different versions of a compositional understanding of the two-natured Christ. So Christ is a complex whole. One of his proper parts is the divine nature, which is the eternal son, the logos of John 1. Another of his proper parts is his human nature, a complete body and soul, which are not a person because of their union with the eternal son, the divine nature. So at the time of incarnation, the son just gains a new part, the human nature, that body and soul just mentioned. Doesn't this sort of view get rid of the contradiction by assigning the incompatible properties to different proper parts of the whole? Compositional accounts are as common as they are influential. You mentioned Dr. Eleanor Stump, Dr. Brian Leftow, Dr. Oliver Chris, and there are others. Ultimately, such accounts push a fairly complicated metaphysical theory to resolve the apparent so-called logical problem of the Incarnation. 
And that's certainly a strategy that can deliver consistency. Details aside, compositional accounts ultimately face a very loud question that, to my knowledge, remains deafeningly unanswered. Namely, why didn't the standard Christology explicitly say as much from the get-go? The standard account, as given, is strikingly simple, saying only that Christ is fully divine, Christ is fully human. But according to the compositional account, the simple account, given just so, is not really so simple. Instead, what was meant all along is not that Christ is fully divine and fully human, but rather that Christ is in part fully divine, that is, has a fully divine part. Christ is in part fully human, Hmm. that is, has a fully human part. Obviously, the qualified claims involving in part divinity and in part humanity aren't even remotely apparently contradictory. Hmm. So why hasn't the tradition stamped at Chalcedon not just said that explicitly, rather than affirm the simpler but unqualified former claims, namely Christ is fully divine, Christ is fully human? The standard account of Christ stamped at Chalcedon involves the simple claim that Christ is both fully divine and fully human. If the lighter claim, the compositional theorists push, that Christ is in part human and in part divine were the key claims, we wouldn't have needed to wait for the complicated compositional metaphysics to assure us that the core of standard Christology is contradictory and free. It would just be obvious. So I reject the compositional accounts largely for reasons that I reject the others we've discussed. They seem not only to be unduly complicated, but they also seem to change the subject. And if there's a simple account that doesn't carry the demands of complicated metaphysics or more pressing, changing the subject or predicate, we should go that route. In my book, I argue that the contradictory account is simpler than such alternatives and doesn't change the subject or the predicates. And as far as the difficult metaphysics, I think there's usually talk in these type of accounts about property borrowing, like the whole gets to have, or at least to be spoken of as having a quality exactly because the proper part has it. I don't know. Those always seem dodgy to me for some reason. Well, it may be they seem dodgy because it looks like these principles are being forced into the account because the account took off in the wrong direction from the beginning. So I I share your reaction to it. I don't have a more detailed criticism. I mean, for each given compositional account, there's going to be a different account of what it is to have property borrowing and which principles are the right one and so on. But... Mm -hmm. I share your sort of flat-footed reaction. It just looks strange. And notice there's no strangeness at all if you say Christ is in part fully divine, has a fully divine part, that is. Christ is in part fully human, has a fully human part. If you're going to talk that way, if this is all talk about parts, just say it. Hmm. There's no unclarity there. You know, we can debate on how parthood works and that sort of thing. But why say Christ is fully divine and Christ is fully human when all you meant was has a part that's fully divine, has a part that's fully human? How hard is that? It doesn't even use more ink. And if too much property borrowing from part to whole goes on, then you're just going to end up with the whole Christ being peccable and impeccable. And then we're kind of back to the problem we started with. That's correct. I actually have a long unpublished notes on that issue that largely Tim Paul made me think of it on that very issue. It looks like you have to stop somewhere in an unprincipled way. Mm. I mean, there can be explanations for, well, if we don't stop here, then we have all this and so on. But I agree with you. It's certainly complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's complicated. Why? Because If we're trying to make sense of this simple Chalcedon statement, everyone sees a contradiction and everyone says, well, that can't be. And you're off and running. And if you read the is as something about parts and this and that, okay. But then why didn't the claims just say that? Hmm. When the Trinity's podcast returns, why isn't the key to understanding the divine and human Christ the idea that On becoming incarnate, he emptied himself of something. 
Dr. Beale, some nowadays think that a key to understanding the incarnate divine and human Christ is this idea of kenosis or emptying, the Greek word kenosis coming from Philippians 2.7. So perhaps Christ, when he became human, set aside the exercise of his divine powers, or maybe he simply stopped being impeccable at that point, temporarily becoming peccable. Why shouldn't we get rid of this Christological contradiction in this way? This view is not considered in my book, mentioned, but not considered, because as you said from the start, the simple Chalcedonian core defines the standard view according to which Christ is fully divine and fully human. Anything less is a rejection of the standard theory of Christ. Of Mm. course, canonic heresies are obvious routes away from the apparent contradiction, and as you say, They invoke motivation for the strategy from Paul's words in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. But Philippians 2, 5 through 8 needn't drive or even invite one away from Christ's divinity. In fact, I've never seen it as such. In the end, the incarnation doesn't take away Christ's divine properties, as affirmed at Chalcedon. Rather, the incarnation augments Christ's properties beyond the divine ones, and does so in a way that, as Paul said in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, gives Christ the appearance of being human and so of being ordinary, of being without notable reputation, of being far from divine, and much more. Yes, to accept that that given lowly human appearance is veridical, that Christ is genuinely human, while also holding that Christ is fully divine, is to accept something that starkly smacks of contradiction, the same contradiction that many have seen in the simple Chalcedonian axiom, so to speak. But as I say in the book, no serious Christian thinker, and certainly not the Apostle Paul himself, ever held that the truth of Christ was ordinary or familiar. So while the canonic strategy as a response to the contradiction is indeed a strategy for gaining consistency, I see it as under-motivated, particularly in comparison with a simple contradictory account, which, as you know, I advance in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right that this strategy is just flat against the Chalcedonian tradition. And uh, Tim Paul, yeah, makes this case in his book as well. I find that when theologians or apologists talk about kenosis and laying aside the exercise of powers and so on, they're, they're kind of just hand-waving, like they don't really realize that that's not going to solve the problem, it's not going to get rid of the contradiction. My former teacher, Stephen T. Davis, and a few other evangelical philosophers like Stephen Evans, they have seen that actually the price that's required for kenosis to get rid of the contradiction is you have to change what you think the divine attributes are. So, for instance, you just don't have omniscience and omnipotence as divine attributes anymore. Right. And you replace them with uh, some convoluted property like uh, omniscient unless temporarily decides not to become omniscient so as to become incarnate and think whatever that is. Um. <laughs> That's right. First, I agree with them, and I'm glad you brought that up. Taken in that way as not rejecting the full divinity and full humanity of Christ, but rather rejecting that the full divinity and full humanity entails what we normally hold that it entails. That is a strategy that needn't give up Chalcedon. As Sarah Coakley points out in a paper, something about what the councils demand and what they don't. I, I, that's not the title, but, but it's an excellent paper. Um, And she basically says, look, the councils just sort of give you the summary of who Christ is, but they don't go to the work of what is involved in being divine, what is involved in being human. And so the canonic strategy along the lines that you're thinking of it is what in my book I call the upstream strategy. And this is advocated a bit by Richard Cross, 
though until now I never thought of it as really holding hands with the canonic tradition. But that's interesting. My own view is, as you say, once you start trying to change the entailments from divine and human, I'm not sure what you're talking about. And in order to keep everything consistent, you wind up making it so complicated that it's not clear what we're even talking about anymore. Yeah. They would say, hey, look, this incarnation thing is so important that we should be willing to reconsider our core convictions about what divinity is in light of it. But I've thought for a long time that it can't get rid of all of the contradictions that come up. So maybe omniscience and omnipotence, maybe impeccability, but I don't see how it gets around, say, created and uncreated or necessarily existing versus, uh, you know, contingently existing. So it seems to me there's contradictions left over from this type of uh, philosophically informed kenosis strategy. I never could see how they could get rid of all the contradictions. I could understand how maybe if you accept a certain price, you could get around some of them, but not all. Actually, that's really interesting. And you made me think of something that um, I'll just mention. My own view is, I mean, it looks strongly contradictory as everyone sees. And so you have all these different routes, including the heresies around the contradiction. And my view is we should accept the contradiction. Mm -hmm. But along the canonic lines that you just described in general, I agree with you. If you try to empty out what it means to be divine while still claiming it's divine and empty out what it means to be human while still claiming it's going to be human, in order to get around every contradiction brought about by Christ who's both divine and human, you're probably going to wind up with an empty account of divinity and an empty account of humanity. If you avoid heresies, by the way, you're probably going to have the empty view of, hum of divinity and humanity. And you might avoid contradiction and you might avoid heresies. But now what's the price? Maybe this is exactly the time at which you say, it's all a mystery. We don't know. Divine, we just say Christ is divine. There's nothing that's entailed by that except that Christ is divine. Christ is human. There's nothing that's entailed by that except that Christ is human. And we can say no more. I see this as actually a live option, but I just think it's, I don't know if disingenuous is the right word, but... I myself could never accept it. I just think to say that divinity of God entails none of these properties is, um, well, I, I just don't know what we're talking about anymore. Yeah, it clashes with a lot of biblical thinking and perfect being reasoning about God. I mean, you can find some patristic thinkers who pound on the table really heavily that you just can't understand deity. You can't grasp it. At all. You can't grasp the divine nature at all. But I don't know that in other moments they seem to grasp it just fine, even if they can't yeah, fully understand yeah, yeah, it or explain that's, that's, it. That's the thing. That's exactly right. You can get around the contradiction. You can get around the heresies by being silent, saying only what's explicitly said. Hmm. But I don't know. I just see it as a responsibility of any truth-seeking thinker that you don't just say things. If you say them and have no idea what you're saying, then say that. <laughs> you know <laughs> but interesting dr beale thanks for talking with us it's been a really interesting conversation i've been delighted to be here dale i truly appreciate it and i'm very honored by your engagement with my work so thank you very much This week's thinking music has been the track Cloud Launching by Little Glass Men. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinities podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook. And help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. 
Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.